Hi, everyone. We have the distinction of anchoring today's prestigious conference. My name is Edward Sassauer. I head up Kirkland's market-leading restructuring practice, but many of you in the Penn and Warren communities simply know me as professor. Today, I have the great honor and distinction of interviewing the third and final keynote speaker, private equity titan, founding partner of Searchlight Capital, and the architect of one of the greatest distressed private equity plays in history in charter communications, Eric Zinterhofer. Eric, welcome to today's program. It's great to be here. Thanks, Edward. Uh, Eric, I thought we would begin the program on a personal note. Maybe tell the audience a little bit about yourself, where you were born, where you were raised, what did your parents do, a little bit about your upbringing, and what impact, if any, that had on your career. Well, I, I grew up in the tri-state area, mostly in New Jersey. I was born in Washington, D.C. Uh, went to Penn, so it wasn't far afield for me. Um, I came from a family of doctors um, and lawyers. Um, so my father, who's a physician, and my grandmother and grandfather, his parents, who were physicians, were none too pleased when uh, I went to Penn and studied economics and history. No, I was not in Wharton, uh, and um, somehow managed to morph into my career. Uh, and so I, I had to learn on the fly. Uh, I was surrounded by some really interesting students at Penn who kind of uh, we're, we're talking about the world of finance. I thought I was going to be an economics professor and get a doctorate, and I was very intellectual at the time. Um, I went and worked at J.P. Morgan for a year and you know, kind of concluded that economics was a bit of a voodoo science and that having a fundamental grounding in finance was more interesting. And I was fortunate enough, after a year at J.P. Morgan Asset Management, to get an offer to go to Morgan Stanley. And, and I was in the energy group there. It was, it was a hard-charging group, to say the least. Uh, we did a lot of our own M&A, a lot of our own corporate finance, because it was such an idiosyncratic industry, and the accounting was completely different. So we, we had to do everything on our own. And I, I, I had a great fundamental training experience there as a second and third year analyst before going off to Harvard Business School. Um, and in the summer in between years at Harvard Business School, uh, I was lucky enough to get a summer internship at a small firm at the time called Apollo. And when I say small, it was we were investing a $1.8 billion fund. There were 12 or 13 people at the firm. Uh, and um, I, I was among the first group of junior hires since the firm's founding. Uh, and we'll get, maybe get into this a little bit more, but I had a really great, that was, that was the most seminal part of my career prior to Searchlight. I spent 13 years there before starting Searchlight in the summer of 2010. So you had a very uh, general uh, training, um, and it sounds like the beginning of your career wasn't that intentional. You were sort of feeling your way through finance. Today, it feels like uh, students are much more intentional at a much earlier age. They specialize much earlier in their career. Uh, do you think that is, a, is helpful or harmful for their future development? We don't love it. Um, I, I think the idea that as a sophomore at Wharton, you're interviewing for a job that you will take in the summer after your junior year at an investment bank, where if you do well, you'll then get an offer back. And if you get an offer back within six months of joining that firm after you graduate, you're interviewing for your next job for two years. Uh, is crazy. You know, what that really means is the first four years after you graduate is determined largely by how you interview at the end of sophomore year. Yeah. I, that to me is shocking. Uh, and we've changed at our firm. We won't, we won't go through that hiring process. We will only hire or start interviewing somebody who's worked for at least a year out of college. Because that first year is, I mean, you, know, you talk about dog years, that's dog years multiplied by three. Yeah. Um, and you learn so much about yourself, what you love, what you don't like, and you learn about how you can function as a professional, what you're willing to do and not do. And we, we feel like we need that information, and so does the person interviewing. They need that information about us before they can join. 
Now, are you still, the people you're interviewing uh, a year or plus of work experience, do they still have gone through that same experience where they had to, as a sophomore, uh, you know, figure out what they wanted to do for the rest of their lives? Or are you taking chances on sons of doctors who went to arts and sciences and didn't realize they wanted to be an investor until, you know, several years later? It's it's a mix. You know, I, I don't think we are as, I, I, I wish I could say only the latter. We're doing a little bit of a combination and we've gone back and forth. I think where we sit right now is because we're only interviewing people who've worked for at least a year, uh, you know, we're relying on, we're, we're looking within the investment banks at people who, you know, have really started to come on strong in that first year um, and may not, you know, they maybe didn't come from Wharton. The Wharton kids, are, they, they have a big advantage. You guys are well positioned. Congratulations. I'm very happy about that. I have two sons at Wharton. But, you know, from somebody who came from an arts and science experience, um, experience and background, Though, you know, that group, if they're passionate about it, will start to come on strong after a year of working. And we want that extra data so we can find those kinds of people as well. Great. So uh, let's uh, take us through the, the beginning part of your career. You, as you said, you had the opportunity to work at one of the all-time great institutions in Apollo during its most formative years, We're right as they were just about to experience explosive growth. So what was it like? And uh, just take us through some of the sort of the early experiences and early deals uh, before we get to Charter. I'm going to want to take a deep dive into Charter. Yeah, sure. You know, I think, you know, just one precursor before we get to the deals. What was great about Apollo for me and, you know, what we really think a lot about at Searchlight, uh, because we are smaller, is mentorship. I had two mentors at Apollo who made all the difference for me. Um, in the early years, it was Rob Katz. He's now CEO of Vail Resorts. Uh, for those of you in the audience, look at Vail Resorts stock price over the last decade, you know, under Rob's leadership. It's, he's an extraordinary leader. Um, so he, we, Vail Resorts was a longstanding portfolio company at Apollo, and he ultimately um, left to run it. Um, my next mentor, who I view as maybe the most brilliant investor that I've been around in my career, at least you know, at, you know, in person closely is Mark Rowan. Mark's now, as many of you know, CEO of Apollo, and you know, I had the privilege of working with him for many years. So that was, to me, one of the key elements of my learning and you know, subsequent success at Apollo. The other dynamic, uh, which I think is relevant for you today, is just the time period in which I joined. So this was, I came out of business school. This was in the 97, 98 period. Uh, we know, maybe some in the audience won't know, you guys were quite young at the time, if not, maybe not even born in certain instances. Yeah. Um, the internet bubble was at its apex in the late 1990s. And some of the things that we're seeing today, you know, if you look at like a lucid market valuation, which was taken public by a SPAC, take a look at that, that is very, there were, things like that in droves in the late 1990s. So I joined Apollo, who were among the best fundamental investors in the world at a time when this was going on. Yeah. And it was perplexing to say the least. Uh, we, we watched that, we, we were kind of, I'd say, cautious during that period, which was very good for us. And then as that bubble burst, and you think about 9-11, you think about the recession in 01, 03, uh, we were extremely aggressive in uh, picking up the pieces um, from the internet net, and telecom bubble bursting. And that's when I really got involved in telecommunications on both sides of the Atlantic. So prior to the bubble bursting, is it fair to say that you and your colleagues at Apollo were having a bit of an existential crisis, wondering, is your style of investing outdated and is there a future for, for fundamental investing? Absolutely. There's... There was a former Drexel uh, guy, because a lot of the Apollo guys came from Drexel, who came with the idea of funding a business called Global Crossing, mm -hmm. uh, which was putting a bunch of subsea cable across the Atlantic. It seemed like a terrible and capital intensive business that could be uh, where there was a lot of excess capacity. We passed on it. That 20 million investment would have been worth at one point probably five to $10 billion. 
The business, by the way, subsequently went bankrupt. Yeah, famous chapter and, 11 and case. Famous chapter 11 case. So it just gives you a sense of how crazy the roller coaster ride was during that period. Fortunately, you know, for us, we did have an existential crisis, but late enough <laughs> that we didn't do anything about it yeah. other, than, other than we did switch to casual from suit and tie. That was the one <laughs> big thing that happened. And, and Leon wanted us to go back, but we didn't go back. Uh, but but we, we managed to uh, avoid a lot of mistakes that were made during that period. Uh, now, did you see signs uh, and and the the bubble starting to crack a bit? So you were poised to uh, pick up those pieces, or did it happen all at once and then everyone grabbed their battle armor and you know and joined the fray? I mean, I was a young guy at the time, but I had enough um, you know insight and input from the senior guys. Um, such that, you know, between my own curiosity and their pattern recognition, we were anticipatory. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, at the time, there were some things going on that are a little bit different from this bubble. Um, the amount of leverage, just corporate leverage, was extraordinary um, in some of these subsectors, particularly telecom. So there were businesses uh, that were, you know, in Europe, people were paying 20 times EBITDA for cable businesses, and but putting on 12 times leverage, too, mm -hmm. and using high yield for the first time. Europe really is not a very high yield oriented market, as, yeah. as you know well. And so we saw, we saw what could happen when, if the bubble burst around some of these high yield names in Europe. And so I started spending time with these companies you know, when they were still trying to raise equity just to learn more so that we could be poised um, to buy the debt uh, when the time was right. And at this point, you were still a generalist. You hadn't yet started to sub-specialize in TMT, correct? That's right. Yeah, you know, the firm, we were all generalists back then. Uh, and we all started to specialize really, I'd say, kind of post that 9-11 recession. Mm -hmm. um, the firm grew substantially. Uh, we went from probably a $3 billion fund to like a $10 billion fund or three and a half to 10, I forget exactly. And that required, you know, getting deeper into sectors. And that's when I started focusing really exclusively in media and communications. So tell us about some of those early deals as you started to develop your specialty. Yeah, I mean, I think the ones that, that, are, that are interesting, some of them came out of that distressed period and became more traditional private equity deals. Uh, we did a roll-up of German cable, uh, which was a fascinating deal in so many ways. This was a business when we took it over that looked like an analog cable network that you and I grew up with. Yeah. It wasn't two-way. There was no internet. You know, it was 20 or 30 stations. That's it. Yeah. Um, but it was a well-engineered network, and we bought the first business through the first consensual uh, distressed process, mm -hmm. we think, in Germany, ever. Wow. And um, did some things that are more commonplace today, but were very unusual back then to avoid criminal liability by moving you know, jurisdictions of uh, insolvent holding companies outside of Germany to the United States and some other novel things at the time. But from there, we built up a series of companies, really just through traditional private equity, to form a behemoth in Germany, uh, which not only spanned, we upgraded the network to a two-way broadband network. We bought all the rights to the Bundesliga in Germany, which is, was a huge deal. And this was now around the time of the World Cup being in Germany, and became a little bit of a media conglomerate. We ultimately sold the business to Liberty. So that was a fascinating journey that we, where we did a number of different types of transactions and strategic things that carried us into, I'd say, the mid, you know, kind of 2005, 2006 time frame. I think we sold it fully later on. So for those in the audience who are not familiar, uh, Germany is famous for having an incredibly rigid restructuring regime that makes it hard to restructure companies. So were you cognizant at the time that you were sort of inventing a playbook? Uh, or were you just trying to solve problems on a daily basis and only years later did you look back and, and, and realize what you had accomplished? Yeah, I think it was, we were really trying to solve problems on a daily basis. I mean, we couldn't even find lawyers to do this stuff. Yeah. We, we cycled through several different corporate lawyers and we were kind of working with them to try to navigate a consensual process because the base case in Germany at the time was just liquid it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, we could have, I mean, we, we knew that that was a possibility and we would have put more money in to just 
you know, par out the, you know, the first land banks. But our preference was to reinstate them, you know, convert our, what was the high yield debt that we bought to equity, and, and keep the company out of an insolvency process so we could get going operationally faster. And that was extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of roadblocks along the way, legally, culturally, uh, the, and there, we, we had to problem solve in a number of different ways by being creative legally, you know, moving jurisdictions and those kinds of things. But also we had to leverage relationships and call in favors. Yeah. Um, and there's some stories that I can't repeat publicly yeah, sure. around that, but it's, um, it, was, it was an extraordinary deal in many ways. What was the next uh, stepping stone in your career? Well, I think on the back of, of that period, you know, as I mentioned, the firm was very successful um, across a number of different um, areas coming out of that 01, 03 period, raised a much larger fund. And because the firm was small, I was able to grow with the firm. I was elevated to partner somewhere along the way and focused on media and telecom. And at that point, uh, you know, I think the, you know, the, the mentorship period, which started with, with Rob Katz and then went to Mark Rowan, mm -hmm. you, know, I, I, you know, I started to become more independent. And, um, you know, I always, I always still went to Mark. Uh, you know, sometimes he'd kick me out and say, you know what you're doing, leave. But yeah. I, I, he was such a great thought partner. I always availed myself of that. But, you know, I was increasingly independent around the deals that I was doing. And... Um, and as we got into that 06, 07 period, uh, things looked very toppy again. And um, you know, I was getting increasingly concerned. I was, you know, the fund was big. I was looking at a lot of large transactions. I couldn't get comfortable with them. You know, at one point, I was doubting myself and saying, look, you know, should I be more aggressive around these things? Mm -hmm. you know, these other firms are beating me to the punch on this stuff. Um, and, but you know, I, I think what really helped me during that period was just my training. You know, just you know, saying, look, forget about atmospherics. Let's look at the fundamentals. Let's let's keep asking ourselves questions around that. Let's not get too caught and set in our ways. But let's focus on fundamental reasons to do or not do things. And um, fortunately, you know, during that, I'd say it was like a 12 to 18 month period, kind of leading into the Great Recession. You know, I was I, I didn't do a lot, and when the Great Recession hit, you know, I was ready to pounce, and yeah. and the firm in general was was poised to do so, and that that was another huge moment, you know, for Apollo and for for me and yeah, and the firm. Uh, there's a couple of great life lessons in there. Um, sometimes the best thing to do is nothing. Yeah. Right. Sometimes those firms that are beating you to the punch, they're beating you to the punch of the next global crossing. Uh, and also, uh, you know, Mark, as you said, was a great mentor to you and a great thought partner. But I think part of that was also you were probably a great protege. As you said, you always availed yourself of, of his thought leadership and his thought partnership. And, and so it's a, it's a two-way street. So that's also probably a good lesson for our audience members. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, the Great Recession hits and uh, – and, and is this a good time for us to delve into Charter? Sure. Yeah, Charter. Charter, all the, all the distressed things that I had done, you know, mainly in that 01, 03 period, were complex. Um, but they were a little bit off of people's radar screen. Mm -hmm. You know, these were, you know, the first restructurings of their kind we did in Germany. I did another one in Switzerland uh, with Mark. And it was... Um, they were they were they were complex, but Charter was different. It was a massive capital structure, uh, you know, well over twenty billion dollars in debt, and uh, it was a capital structure that had like eight different layers to it. Um, they were you know pretty nicely stacked. They did a good job of clarifying seniority, which was for a capital structure with that many layers is unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, we were simultaneously doing a restructuring of Lyondell, which was in some ways more complicated when it came to that. But what made Charter complicated was picking the so-called fulcrum security. So one of the key elements as an investor in a distress situation, if you want to uncap your upside, buy debt at a discount and convert it to equity and uncap your upside, is to find the security that will predominantly take the equity. And if you're in a capital structure with two layers of debt, 
you know, it's relatively easy. Yeah. With eight layers, it's hard. And so what we had to do, and I never had to do this before, is basically buy across three layers in the capital structure. And then just think about, you know, all the different scenarios and how those would play out. Uh, you know, maybe the more senior one gets part out. Maybe that becomes the fulcrum security and the, the two more junior layers get wiped out. What do the returns look like in that scenario? Um, and so there was a lot of game theory um, just in the, that, that part of the analysis. Did it become harder and harder to buy more as people, as it became clear in other people's minds what it is Apollo was trying to accomplish there? Well, you know, we, fortunately at that point in time, that, that is normally the case. And, you know, just what, what you highlighted is a huge challenge in buying debt if you're viewed as smart money. And so we, we, we employed a lot of strategies, you know, whether it was early on in charter and a lot of different situations to really mask what we were doing, which is hard to do. Uh, but when we bought most of our debt here, we were in a massive market freefall. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was, you know, it looked like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley were failing. Yeah. Uh, and so, and we were averaging down. Mm -hmm. And if you looked at our mark to market on the position, you know, we had 1.1 billion of the firm's capital in this, which was, you know, it, that's a big amount even today. That was a huge amount back then. Yeah. Uh, our mark to market, I mean, we were down three, four hundred million dollars on a mark to market basis, and yeah. we just kept buying. And so, in Lyondell as well, I think that's become a, an Apollo hallmark is averaging down and having confidence in your position. And absolutely, Lyondell was a, a spectacular deal where the same dynamics were at yeah. play. So and th those were the two big positions that we were building. Those are the two by far biggest positions that we were building during that period. So it was, I have to say, and, you, and you're just retesting and retesting your assumptions. Yeah. And um, it takes you know, a lot of fortitude to do that. It takes experience and support from the broader partnership mm -hmm. to be able to look at that every day. Um, but, but there was a point in time where we didn't need to mask it. Everybody was like, right. you can have it. Right. You know, this thing, everything's going, you know, everything's yeah. falling apart. Fair. Fair. Uh, okay, so uh, you've now amassed your positions in three of the eight tranches. Um, and, you, um, and you start to make your way through the Chapter 11 restructuring. Uh, and the concept of reinstatement uh, becomes front and center. So maybe touch on that. Yeah, so one of the, one of the huge elements of this case is, was the reinstatement. So we had bought, as I mentioned, across these tranches of junior debt, there was, I think, roughly $8 billion of first lien debt uh, that was in place. And um, basically, our view is that that debt should be reinstated we could reinstate it. You know, there's an ipso facto rule in bankruptcy, uh, which means that, you know, among other things, that a change of control or some kind of change wrought in ownership as a result of bankruptcy can't, or other things can't create covenant breaches yeah. in the first lien. Um, and so what the first lien was arguing is, look, that rule does not apply. There has been a change of control. And the reason there's a change of control is because you and a few of these other um, bondholders are a group, kind of a capital G group, working together, mm -hmm. kind of colluding, collaborating. And so that was there was there was a nine-month litigation around this, which was um, very closely watched um, and you know very fraught. And um, ultimately, we prevailed. Uh, which, which really was critical and helped us get through the restructuring. Uh, so it was, it was a, and, and Kirkland and Ellis was, very, was actually representing Charter at the time, was the lead in making the arguments um, in conjunction with the bondholders around this because, you know, this was, this was a prearranged Chapter 11. Um, and what that means, it wasn't, if it was totally prepackaged, <laughs> we wouldn't have had this issue with the first lien. But it was, we did have a, an agreement in place yeah. between the company and most of the creditors, including the bondholders, on how to prosecute the case. So we were working with Kirkland and Ellis, uh, which was company's counsel, pretty closely on this. So you prevail in the litigation. You emerge from bankruptcy, and now you're just at the starting point. 
right? Now you actually have to build this company. So to take us through uh, that process. That was, uh, that, that's right. I mean, it, you know, ultimately you say, okay, well, we bought the debt, hopefully cheap. We created the company, I think, at, you know, kind of five and a half times EBITDA, certainly in time, inside six. We had tremendous tax assets. The business was cash generative. It looked like a great purchase yeah. as we emerged from this. But Charter was also literally the worst cable company in the United States. <laughs> Customers did not like us. And uh, we needed, and the business, because it had been over leveraged for so long, really hadn't invested in their network and done some fundamental things that you know, I knew we needed to do because we had gone through an analog to digital two-way conversion in Germany. I mean, you just learn the whole business when you're building a network like that. And, and so we just needed to change them. We needed to change the team and we needed to change the mindset. Uh, I thought, and this was, you know, a good lesson in setbacks. Uh, we thought we had our leader. Uh, Neil Smith had come into charter just before the restructuring uh, to shepherd it through. And he is and was a fantastic leader um, who had been at AOL. He was the first person to really work well with the shareholders, the former shareholders, Paul Allen and others at the time at Charter. And I, I thought very highly of Neil. And an American hero. And an American hero. The, if you look at Neil's background, he was a leader of one of the original SEAL teams back during the Reagan era. And he is, he's a great American. Um, and so uh, he was going to be our guy until Comcast poached him. <laughs> uh, and I think, you know, Neil wanted to get to one of the coasts. He had an offer he couldn't refuse. Yeah. And uh, we were, I thought, oh, my goodness, I've got this difficult operational turnaround. We just lost a great leader. Uh, fortunately for us, after an interim period, we found arguably you know, the best CEO in cable history and Tom Rutledge. Uh, and he came over from cable vision. I was, I was, I remember having lunch with him um, after being told that he would never leave cable vision because he had just signed a new contract. And by the end of lunch, Tom telling me, you know what, I want to take this on. And I thought, all right, here we go. Wow. And that was a huge moment for us. Uh, I mean, the stock was probably somewhere between 40 and $60 a share at that point. Stock's over $600 a share today. I mean, you're talking about over $100 billion in market cap creation under Tom's leadership. Do you remember uh, the, the metrics for what you invested and today what that is worth? Yeah, or? I mean, it would be, well, I think our basis at the time, we were in the high 20s. Amazing. So if you just think about that on a billion dollars, if you had held it to today. Now, we sold it along the way to John Malone. Yeah at a good profit for us. But if you look at, you know, Liberty Broadband and the profits they've made since, it's been extraordinary yeah. too. Fascinating story. So at this point, you're about 38 years old? I was, yeah, I'm, can, I'm approaching 38, exactly. Okay, so you're 38 years old. You are uh, one of the stars at Apollo. You're on the tip of everyone's tongue. You have what everyone spends their entire life trying to accomplish, and you've done that, and then you go and, and, and leave to found searchlights. It was a very hard decision. And, um, you know, I mean, you kindly said those things about me. I didn't feel that way about myself, and I'll come to that in a minute, and I'm glad I didn't. That was good self-awareness on my part. Um, and, but, you know, for me, it was not a logical decision, uh, and not, a, not a smart financial decision. Um, and I knew that at the time. You know, I had every, I, 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 you could see where Apollo was going. Um, I knew the talent and, and the capabilities of, of the firm. Uh, so for me, this was a very personal decision. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I'm the son of a doctor. You know, if you, somebody had told me that I would have done this well financially, I would have said, I'm going to go skiing for the rest of my life. I don't need to do this anymore. That's what I'm going to do. So I, you know, for me, it was just, you know, a recognition that life goes by quickly. And I felt I was curious to see if I was up for the challenge and really interested in a more entrepreneurial challenge. And I felt like, you know, I'd done well enough that I was responsible to my family. And, and if I looked back on my 20-year-old self, he would have said, you know, what do you have to lose? Yeah. I mean, really, in the scheme of things. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I became really intrigued with the concept of 
building, you know, uh, our own firm. And I think also part of it is that where Apollo was necessarily going was becoming this really successful, big, bigger, diversified asset manager, which was going to necessarily take me further away from what I loved, which was the investing side. And so it was kind of a confluence of those factors. But I will say what was critical for me when we, when in starting Searchlight, I did this with two other co-founders who are fantastic people who really um, are tremendously talented and accomplished in their own rights. And, and, and they just complimented me. And, I, and I, I, there's no way I could have done this on my own. I didn't have, I'd say, the maturity, the breadth of relationships. Um, and, 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 the, and the firm we set up was, you know, a transatlantic by nature. And so, you know, having, you know, a co-founder and Oliver Harmon, who had come from KKR, who was one of the most accomplished guys in that market, lead our effort in Europe was fantastic. Having Errol Luzamari, who ran the private equity program at Ontario Teachers, which he built from like a $2 billion to a $15 billion program. Um, was unbelievable. I mean, he was a leader of a huge organization. Uh, they made a lot of their own investments directly, but he also understood the investment world really well, which is a huge part of the picture. So having, having that complementary group was, for me, a prerequisite in doing this. I've heard from time and time again from entrepreneurs that having a partner, even if it's not the perfect partner, uh, when launching something, is so fundamental it keeps you sane you know uh in your case you had two exceptional uh founding partners so that that makes it even easier but you know in even in other cases where people you know one partner is superior to the other partner still just having someone else is um is fundamental it is i mean I, you know i've talked to you know we among founders of different firms in different places and you know Sole founders are lonely. It's lonely at the top for them, and and often you know we you know they'll reach out to me, and I'll we'll reach out to them just to talk about their own firm, because they don't have other co-founders to talk to, and you know I'm lucky to have that, uh, and I, I agree with you. It's been it's been a blessing. So take us through the early days of Searchlight and uh, some of the uh, trials and tribulations and successes and and you know, some of the things that you know uh, were easier than you expected and some things that were a little harder than you expected. Yeah, I think you know it's it's a, it's a great question and it's um, I'd say the the thing that we were humble about is that we knew in leaving firms like KKR and Apollo and Ontario Teachers that we were going to be back to hustling on our own and that we wouldn't get the time of day from the street um, around bringing in deals. Fortunately for us, you know, we had started at, you know, Oliver started at KKR when there was two or three people in the London office. And, you know, I started, as I mentioned, at Apollo when there were 12 people and Errol was small when he, uh, Ontario Teachers was small when he started. So we all knew how to hustle and find our own deals. Uh, we also had a very clear view of how we wanted to invest, and we knew how to build teams. I'd say we spent as much time in those early years hiring as we did fundraising. And we were really lucky. We made some great hires early on. Um, you know, the senior guys at our firm are with us to this day. You know, so we've, we've been together at, as a senior group now for a decade, and that team has been tremendous, That's and they've developed tremendously. Uh, I'd say, well, so, you know, it took us, so get, but, but trying to fundraise, you know, do deals, hire a team at the same time is extraordinarily difficult. Yeah. And um, Mark Ologli, who was a very well-known partner at Blackstone, who went on to co-found Centerbridge, and I think recently, um, you know, is, doing, is taking a step back a little bit from Centerbridge, great investor. Uh, he... Uh, asked me to come see him when I was leaving Apollo and starting Searchlight. And he gave me fantastic advice, which was so true. And he said, Eric, you know, when you start a firm, uh, the highs are going to be higher, the lows are going to be lower, but there'll be more highs than lows. And I love th that. that was exactly what the early years were like. Yeah. Uh, was there one deal in particular that you think put Searchlight on the map in those early days? 
You know, not so much, actually. I wish there were. Uh, but it was really just the steadiness of doing you know, stuff in our core sectors. We did a combination of distressed things and kind of classic private equity, but in interesting areas. Uh, you know, we partnered with Liberty around some stuff, which was really interesting in Puerto Rico. Uh, we did one of our first distress deals was in a business called Integra that we renamed Electric Lightwave. Um, and, and that was a very successful deal. We actually bought post reorg equity there. Um, so the, the business had just gone through an out-of-court restructuring and one of the lenders, we bought about 35% of the company from one of the lenders immediately afterwards. And then, you know, kind of operationally improved the business. And, uh, but it came through, it was traded through a distressed desk. Um, so that's where the distressed network could really help. So we did some interesting things early on and I think just kind of steadily built our reputation. Got it. Um, and, you know, that, it's just, it's kind of built, I'd say, at a steady pace. Uh, but a healthy pace over the years. And, and what would you say are Searchlight's core principles? Well, we, you know, we, ha we lay these out for everybody to see. My favorite among our principles is that arrogance kills. That's my favorite one. Yeah. Uh, great people, you know, being at the core of our business is um, a critical principle for us. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about human capital. Um, and, and then the other thing that we are is creative and intellectually curious. And that's allowed us, I'd say, to, you know, hew consistent to our investment thinking over the years, but also evolve in how we express that in ways that have really benefited the firm. Well, I actually want to delve into that because prior to COVID, we had a 12-year bull run. Uh, and when you were starting Searchlight, you were you know, known as being a distressed private equity investor, uh, but there wasn't that many great distressed private equity plays over the last 12 years. So, and so talk about your evolution as an investor and how you had to evolve uh, not just yourself, but all of Searchlight to take advantage of the market conditions. Absolutely. No, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, if you had asked me when I started the firm with Errol and Oliver in 2010, would we be in a, you know, 10 to 12 year bull run? And then when it stopped, and there was a pandemic across the globe that the actual dislocation would last three weeks, I would have said, none of this is ever going to happen. There'll be a dislocation sooner. And by the way, if there's a p pandemic that big, you know, the Fed just printed a few trillion dollars, 08, 09. They're not going to print another six trillion dollars to bail us out again because, you know, we'll lose all credibility around these currencies. So, no, I did not see that coming. Uh, but I'd say there's a couple of things that really helped the firm. I'd say one is what's great about being a distressed investor is that you have a really good understanding of capital structure. And if you have a good understanding of capital structure, you can design securities, design structures in solvent companies to drive very good risk reward. And you can do that in many flexible ways. And you learn to do that. You understand how to read an indenture. You understand how you can be layered. You understand what can happen if things go wrong. And that's a very valuable tool in protecting downside, uh, even in traditional private equity. And we are, we are well known for using creative structures to do that. Uh, and so that really helped us. The other thing that we recognized is that the pace of disruption was increasing asymptotically across all of our industries. So I'd say one of the things that we morphed from doing, you know, I'd say kind of toward the end of fund one and into fund two is we said, okay, we still want to buy businesses well. We want to be creative. Uh, we want to use structure to drive good risk reward. We want to be great partners, which we've become very well known for uh, with founders, strategics, and other things. But we also don't want to just you know, we don't want to just look at our cash on cash return on the business and high five each other. We had like a, we had like a 15% cash on cash return in fund one um, at one point, meaning that we were just, the actual cash generation post interest, post taxes every year was 15% of our equity account in businesses that were growing. You know, that's, that's a good cash on cash return. You're going to make good returns if you do that. But what we were seeing is that, you know, unless we redeployed that cash aggressively, these businesses were getting disrupted. Yeah. And so we said, look, we can't rely on that in fund two. So let's redeploy the cash. Let's buy businesses at good fundamental values, but let's 
really enact growth transformation. You know, let's take a business that was called Harbor Touch and through acquisitions and through, uh, you know, really morphing to software enabled services became Shift4, which has been one of our best investments. Yeah. You know, let's take a company like Rackspace, which has kind of traditional infrastructure, and let's move to a managed cloud service, you know, which was a huge growth transformation uh, where we partnered with Apollo, and it was very successful. And, you know, let's take a traditional copper business and upgrade it to fiber rather than milking it for cash flow and drive growth on the back end, you know, which we're doing with Ziply and Consolidated. Or most recently in Univision, let's take a traditional broadcaster and instead of distributing in traditional ways, let's recognize that the Hispanic audience is one of the most important audiences in America and let's go find them. Yeah. Let's go find them through OTT products and direct-to-consumer products. So I think that, that has been critical to our investment thesis. On the other end of the spectrum, and this is where distressed investing is really helpful, I think, also, is we have invested in growthier businesses where we've come in and said, okay, you know, that valuation seems high, but we know that this business, you know, it's turned the corner, you know, it's, the business model is working. Yes, they're gonna redeploy all their cash flows back into the business, but, you know, the business is probably worth half a billion to a billion dollars, let's say. And we'll go to the founders of that business and say, you could do another equity round but why don't you do something, we wanna be senior in the capital structure, we'll do it with an all pick security so that you're not paying out cash interest. We don't want any cash pay debt senior to us and you don't want that either. Um, and we will, we will take less equity upside so you're diluted less. And so let's say we put $100 million into a business that we're pretty sure is worth 500 million to a billion, but even if it's only, it's definitely worth 100. Um, we've got a good pick return and if, if, if the company hits their plan, we'll still make three, four, or five times our money. Yeah. Um, but, you know, maybe we're giving up, you know, making six to eight times our money on yeah. it in return for seniority. That's where good structuring and a good understanding of stress scenarios can really help on the growth side. And we've, we've benefited from that. What an extraordinary pivot. Uh, almost Netflix esque, how you've you know repositioned uh, the fund over the last few years. Um, uh, piggybacking on the last part about being a good distressed investor, let's talk about last year. So let's talk about you know how Searchlight, uh, the mindset of Searchlight as COVID hit, and when did it dawn on you that we were in this for the long haul, and and how did you? once again reposition the fund to uh, survive and in fact thrive during that environment? That was such a, an extraordinary period. And um, as I was confounded in those first few weeks, um, and my sons can attest to it, I was just sitting in my, uh, you know, out in my home office and I wouldn't leave it, you know, from seven in the morning till 11 at night. Um, and what was confounding for me was um, you know, might, might surprise you because in some ways we anticipated the crisis. We actually, which I doubt many private equity firms did, we actually put a hedge on our second fund where most of our portfolio was, you know, in advance of this crisis really hitting uh, because, you know, you have these liquid positions. It's not as if we could sell them and we were worried about what happened. We made pretty good money on that. Um, and so we, we should have put a bigger hedge on in, in hindsight, but the, you know, we, we were seeing this coming and when the crisis hit, we said, okay, we're, we know we're gonna have to triage in parts of our portfolio, but we have a, a new fund, $3 billion fund, which is largely uninvested. You know, we know what to do yeah. in this situation. We've been here before. So we just, you know, we just said to the firm, we're focusing on credit, get ready. This is gonna be a massive distress cycle. This could be worse than 08, 09. This is a yeah. global pandemic. Yeah. And I'd say about a week and a half, two weeks into that, the Fed flashed $6 trillion in front of everybody. And we were just shocked by how quickly the Fed moved. I think insiders were shocked with how quickly everybody moved around this. And so we're now in a situation where you know, it was great that they flashed six trillion. The economy was still a mess. You're still in the middle of a pandemic. Nobody really knew what was going on. But 
a lot of the easy pickings in distressed went away. Yeah. And so we had to pivot very quickly. And um, we, um, we basically led by actually one of Darren Glad, who was a partner at Apollo with me, who did the charter deal with me. Um, and, um, and Tom Hendrick, who's one of our senior guys in the Opportunities Fund. We, we went out to banks and convinced them at a time when credit was hard to get to put a TRS in place to give us leverage against buying first lien positions in companies that we knew were high quality and would recover, but were heavily COVID affected. So we quickly pivoted away from companies that were cheap that weren't going to be affected by the crisis to very high quality companies that were affected by the crisis. And those, and those credits were still cheap. But if you think about things around sports or you know, things around um, like high quality must do conferences in person where people actually did do business and will continue to do business um, or you know, certain elements of media uh, that required gathering of people. You know, we just went very big into these areas. Um, and because, and our view was, you know, because of the back leverage we had, we could earn extraordinary returns. And if these positions continued to trade down, we would just take off the back leverage and then we'd go loan to own. Yeah. And we expect, and what, so what we, we put on about 30 of these positions, put hundreds of millions of dollars behind this. And we would have expected, if you asked me today, that two or three of those would have become really interesting distress for control opportunities where we'd put another few hundred million behind those. That did not happen. Yeah. All of these things have roared back. It's been a great return for the fund. Um, and it was a good pivot for us. But again, just highlights the, how extraordinary this period was. Yeah. And then, by the way, simultaneously, our portfolio roared back. And we went from you know, looking at, you know, looking into the abyss to taking two companies public that summer, last summer. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've had, our returns have been spectacular and we ended up returning, you know, in, in our $2 billion fund, we returned a billion of capital just in that fund last wow. year and we're gonna on track to return another billion, a billion and a half this year. So, I mean, it's just, I, I'm still wrapping my head around what happened during that period. No, you've lived through a number of cycles and 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 uh, and thrived during them um, tremendously. Uh, when the cycle first hits, the distress cycle, you know, uh, talk to the audience about the, the, those in the audience who are wondering out, like, how do I know if this is the bottom? You know, is it going to drop further? Averaging down, we talked about before at Apollo. You know, uh, talk to us about a little bit about that mindset about you know being bold in the early days of a distress cycle not knowing how deep it may run? Well, I would say in all three distressed periods, 01, 03, 08, 09, and then the very short period um, of last year, um, one thing that was in common among all three is that I was scared. Hmm. And I always find if I'm not scared, we're not there yet. Yeah. Um, and. It, you know, if you're sharing everybody else's fear, that's a good sign yeah. that you're in it. Uh, I remember, you know, I remember thinking our whole banking system was going to fail in 08 and 09. Mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly after 9-11, we were all afraid. Yeah. And everybody in New York was afraid then. Uh, and so that's a prerequisite. And then the question is, you know, like in many facets of life, can you use your professional experience, pattern recognition, to go back and conquer your fear, just like athletes do when they're trying to hit a free throw or something like that. Like, what are your routines? Go back to those, try to block out you know, the emotion, recognize it's there, and use fundamental analysis to analyze the situation. And you know, that's what helped us a lot in Charter. Yeah. You know, we said, okay, you know, the banking system could be a mess, but are people gonna give up broadband in their homes? Yeah. I mean, this is a, you know, a consumer staple, yeah. which is critical. You know, we, and we're buying in at historically low multiples. You could never buy a business like this ever mm -hmm. in the normal course yeah. for, you know, you know, you'd be buying it at four or five multiple points higher at best. Yeah. And so the margin for error just looked so huge. Yeah. The underlying product looks so stable. And then the same thing, you know, with this more recent pandemic, we said, what are the chances that this pandemic lasts 
beyond in you know, 2025. So we were able to underwrite in the, that early period of COVID. You know, a lot of these really good companies, you know, we weren't saying they were going to come back in, you know, 22. We were just like, these things might not come back till 24, 25, and the numbers right. still work. Yeah. And so you just looked at that analysis, and you could say, all right, let's divorce from fear and focus on that. And, you know, the numbers don't lie. This is really interesting on a risk-reward basis. So, Eric, where are we going from here? What does, uh, what does the next year or two or three hold for us? Well, you know, I do think that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating period. I've never tried to, you know, kind of tell the future because I think Howard Marks is really great at teaching people to be careful around this, and I really think he says it much better than I ever could. Um, but, you know, and Howard Marks would say this better, I do think that uh, you can never pick the top in a market, but right now there is, a, say, a universal view that things are not going to be bad for the next few years. Yeah. And usually when there's a universal view that things can't be bad for the next few years, that's a better time to, if you can, you know, take some chips off the table yeah. and, and to be cautious about making new investments. And I'd say that's our overall stance as a firm right now. We are making new investments, but we're just being thoughtful and cautious. We've lost out on more things this year than last year. We were incredibly productive. We made, we did this whole distressed portfolio I mentioned, but we also made six other investments across the firm. And I think that was perfect. This year we might make half of that. Um, so I, I am concerned um, a little bit about you know, the over exuberance in the market right now. Understood. All right, we have some questions from the students and young professionals who are in the audience. So let's see here. Question one, which industries do you see as pre-distressed that investors should monitor? Well, uh, it's, you know, I, I try to maybe make a distinction around this question because you don't, I don't necessarily love investing in industries that are inherently distressed you know we haven't been big you know like oil and gas is a good example yeah. I'm not sure that we, we didn't do a lot in oil and gas even though it became distressed you know elements of retail maybe have some of those features too uh, what I think is interesting is businesses in underlying sectors that remain important but maybe ripe for dislocation and therefore could become distressed, but then if you buy those businesses right, you can reinvest in them and become part of a tr growth transformation. Um, and I think the two sectors that are the most interesting when it comes to that are education and healthcare. And if you look at those two sectors, you know, healthcare is a huge part of our economy, a quarter of our economy maybe growing, um, and it shouldn't be that big. Um, and so it's incredibly ripe for disruption. And there'll be businesses that get over leveraged or that become disrupted, but still have great core assets that could be like Phoenix rising from the ashes. And the same in the education sector. I mean, if you look at, you know, where most of the debt in our ecosystem right now comes from, it comes from healthcare and for younger people from education, you know, from these massive student loans. And uh, people are going to schools and getting degrees that don't necessarily result in better jobs and better outcomes, but they're sitting with significant debt. Yeah. Um, so there's going to be, you know, disruption around skill-based learning, around digital learning and other things to drive solutions there. Um, and the established companies can pivot, but they might fall down first. Mm -hmm. And you might be able to rebuy these companies at lower valuations and then help them pivot. I completely agree. Uh, what advice would you give to would-be founders and entrepreneurs? You touched on some of this already, but any yeah, I mean the advice. Thoughts? I mean the advice I give to. I mean I think it's important to be self-aware around you know when you're ready to do this. So for example, one of the things I say to people who start at Searchlight is that um, if you want to, you know I would I say to the youngest people I would love for you to be in a position by the time you're 40 to go out and start your own firm, for example. Because what that means is you've worked extraordinarily hard for 15 plus years and, and returned your investment many fold that we've made in you. Uh, but the quid pro quo around doing it at that young an age for something like private equity is you're gonna have to work the hours I worked, you know, which is you know, getting in at 7.30 in the morning and not leaving before 10 at night, which I just hewed to you know, for basically the first 
you know, eight to ten years that I was at Apollo. And and if you don't want to do that, that's fine. You could become a partner at Searchlight, you know, into your 40s and 50s, but don't expect, you know, to be able to start your own firm, you know, by the time you're 40. So I think to to really get to you know, that level requires tremendous ed effort and dedication. I just don't think that has changed. There's no way around that. Yeah, there's no shortcuts. All right, final question. Uh, at Searchlight, you arguably engage in a much more diversified style of investing than at Apollo, for instance, making growth equity investments. How did your training in distressed investing inform other styles of investing? You touched on this as well, but maybe you want to expand on it. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it, you know, I might be repeating myself a little bit, but it is, I think there's, I think for us, the combination of recognizing the pace of disruption increasing, but also saying, look, how can we use everything I learned at Apollo and everything we do at Searchlight to make great risk reward investing um, and apply that to growth of your companies, you know, resulted in us doing a lot of the things that I described. And again, you know, I mean, these are, when we go out and design these types of securities that I mentioned earlier to create good risk reward, we're, we're, we're talking to the same lawyers who understand restructuring situations to make sure we're crafting these documents the right way. We're thinking about bankruptcy scenarios. We're thinking about what happens in restructurings. We're thinking about, you know, yeah. um, all of the consequences of a company potentially going sideways. And having that understanding is invaluable, even as a growth investor. Well, thank you, Eric. I've been doing this for the better part of a decade, and I will tell you this is one of the best ones I've uh, had the opportunity to uh, to do, and if not the best one, it's incredibly illuminating, and we're incredibly thankful uh, for your time. Edward, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure. All right. Thanks, all.